Um, this is really fun. We're used to the auroras being a treat for the eyes, but apparently it's a treat for the ears as well. So I want to start by asking you a little bit about your background. Yeah, I'm I'm actually a, a historian and philosopher of science. Um, so I'm very interested in atmospheric sciences, atmospheric physics, but I tend to look at them from a historical point of view um, from the 19th and 20th centuries. So I'm currently a research fellow at Emmanuel College, Cambridge, and I'm carrying out my my work here. Awesome. So what have you been studying here over the past several years as you've been in school? Has it been primarily focused on the auroras? Yeah, my um, my PhD was on the Northern Lights and um, well, the Aurora Borealis and Australis. Uh, and I was mostly looking at visual representations, uh, the changing instruments that we use to register the Northern Lights, but also an embodied uh, corporeal understanding of what witnessing them is like. And that's how I came to the topic of rural sound. But my current postdoctoral work looks a little bit more at other atmospheric phenomena like lightning and St. Elmo's fire and how those have been understood in the past couple of centuries. So let's talk about the auroras. Can you give me a little background for somebody who doesn't know basically how they're caused? We know what they look like, but not everybody knows how that happens. Mm, absolutely. It's um, the energy from the sun, the solar wind is pushing lots of different particles, electrons, positrons uh, towards our atmosphere all the time. And the way that the aurora is caused is that these are uh, primarily the electrons, but there's also some interesting things that happen with the positrons. The electrons, because they're charged, react with the magnetic field that the Earth has and they're channeled uh, along particular pathways, mostly around the poles, but interestingly, not exactly at the poles, uh, but just following the magnetic compass in an oval shape around uh, that area. And they interact with elements in our atmosphere with nitrogen and oxygen, um, bumping into those, uh, increasing their energy levels, which then emits photons of light. And that those are the colors that we see. And depending on which element the solar wind is bumping into, that gives us the different colors of the aurora. Okay, and we typically see them in higher latitudes? Absolutely, yes, yes. In generally around roughly the Arctic Circle, um, but they can come down much lower, uh, and they have done in, in the past in the Carrington event, for example, but, but even more recently, you can see them from Scotland, in England, some, or in Britain sometimes. Does time of year matter? Or is it more dependent on the sun's activity? Generally, auroral activity follows the solar cycle, which is an 11 year cycle. Um, and we're coming up to a maximum now in 2025 and 2026. So that will be a really good time to see the Northern Lights, hopefully. But but also in, in autumn and spring tend to be really good times to see the Northern Lights. Okay, so we are in kind of a, a higher active period right now because I didn't know if it was I'm hearing about it more or seeing more pictures or if it actually was more active. But I mean, people are taking pictures in places like Virginia um, and mm. that's, that seems new and different, right? Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely right. It, it sometimes can be, uh, it can be surprising because sometimes we don't expect the sun to be so active. Um, in these years leading up to the, the bigger activity. But yeah, we've, I've definitely been hearing more about it lately. Yeah. So in all of the pictures and everything we've seen online, they're beautiful, there's no doubt. But I, I've never heard of someone talking about the sound that it makes. So can you tell me a little bit about that and how this was first discovered, if it was folklore for so long, and the process that that has gone through? Yeah, that was one of the really exciting parts of my research, finding out about all these different accounts of the sound. You're quite right that it started off as being discovered through folklore, through lived experience. Um, there, there was an increase in the volume of accounts of a rural sound uh, coming from very different places, coming from northern Canada, coming from the Shetland Islands, coming from Norway and Russia. And it was interesting that all of the accounts seemed to corroborate one another. They were all um, talking about very similar types of sounds, often, you know, often on the edge of perception, not quite perceptible. Um, 
but maybe increasing with increased auroral activity and always of this kind of crackling, staticky nature. Um, and because there were so many accounts corroborating each other, that's when it really got the interest of the scientific community. And when did that happen? So that happened around... I've written papers on the first international polar year, which happened in 1882. And that was a period where um, a lot of expeditions to the Arctic were sent out from, from Europe, from North America. Um, and there were people that were going to temporarily uh, live in little huts in the Arctic for a year, observe the aurora, do some other measurements as well. Um, and they were listening out for the aurora. They knew that there was this folklore, that it had a sound. They were interacting with people local to the Arctic who were telling them that it had sounds. But unfortunately, there was only one person on one of those expeditions that actually claimed to hear the sounds. Um, and he, not many people believed him at the time. It was a bit controversial. So then throughout the sort of late 19th and early 20th century, a lot more people became interested in these sounds. And it was in the second international polar year in 1932, when the investigation was much more thorough, um, more people were hearing the sounds. But the, then there was still quite a lot of skepticism from the scientific community, even then as well. Yeah, what is you say, like a crackling or popping sound, it seems like that, that's something that can be mistaken for something else? Mm. Yeah, there. I mean, there are beautiful descriptions in the literature talking about the. It sounded like the buzzing of a bee, or the rustling of velvet, or um, but yeah, paper shuffling together, um, and all of those sounds, although they're quite evocative, could be, yeah, something like crunching of snow, or or perhaps you know, people were talking about it could be ice particles and those kind of interacting with the air and the atmosphere. Um, and it, it also occurred to a lot of people that it could be a psychological phenomenon. It could be that you're seeing this beautiful auroral display and it kind of conjures a sound in your mind, whereas it's not necessarily an objective sound that exists. So all of those arguments were certainly being put forward in these periods. It was quite hard to tell what was what was real sound and what was either imaginary or uh, a different cause. Okay, so fast forward to now in the past 20, 30 years. This has been proven, correct? So there is still some debate within the scientific community. There's still uh, a few different ideas. Generally, it's largely accepted that there is a sound that uh, is associated with the Northern Lights, but it's not dis discovered entirely what how that sound is produced, what triggers the sound, why it should exist. Um, there are the researchers in, in Finland at the moment who are carrying out sound observations. Um, and their theory is that there's an inversion layer in the atmosphere where instead of getting cooler as you ascend, it suddenly gets warmer at about 70 meters above the ground. And their idea is that the, the um, electrical discharge from the aurora that's happening with those electrons we were talking about earlier, um, they have quite complicated brush discharges that come down to this point at 70 meters above um, the atmosphere. And at that point, they then discharge in people's glasses that they're wearing, or even their clothes that can pick up static, or trees that are nearby. Um, and that's when you get the sound. So the sound is much more close to Earth in their in their view. Um, but again, they, they haven't discovered why the sound is triggered for some auroral displays and, and not for others. Can you tell me about the different types of scientists that are working on this research? Mm, absolutely. There, there are a lot of meteorologists. There are also uh, geophysicists in northern Norway who are really interested in this. Um, there are there are physicists like the group in uh, Finland. Uh, Unto Leina is the uh, PI working on that project. Um, but there are also a lot of amateur observers who are really interested. It's not just the scientific community. There's it's really valuable to have crowdsourcing practices and to understand what people are experiencing when they're going outside and witnessing the Northern Lights. So um, there are a lot of different people who are interested in this topic and trying to push forward the research.
Yeah, I can imagine it's really important to have that crowdsourcing. I'm curious though how people are recording the sound. There is there a huge range and some people have their phone and they're just recording it to mm-hmm. also maybe some people with very high end sound equipment? Yes, the group in Finland have um, some precision technology and they're funneling the sound into their recording devices because, like I said, it's quite, um, it can be very quiet and you need to be in a space where there isn't a lot of other sound happening as well. I don't imagine you'd be able to pick it up on a phone recording. I don't know if anybody has tried that. Um, but if you listen to the Finland group's uh, recordings, they they have a really brilliant one where there's a, a sudden clap that they hear. There's kind of a snap um, rather than a low level buzzing, which which they infer is is also created by the aurora. So um, yeah, they're able to pick up maybe some different sounds that you can't necessarily always hear yourself. Or you can't necessarily pick up just on a phone. Is there any connection? Has anybody done any research on any connection between colors and sounds? That's an interesting one. There's There's been a lot of work on the color of the aurora, uh, a lot of spectroscopy going on. Um, and there has been some radio imaging as well, uh, which has been really interesting. But I think, in all honesty, the, co- the color and the sound have been generally quite separate. Um, especially because the sound has had these connotations of being uh, maybe a little bit to do with mythology, a little bit to do with folklore, not so mainstream uh, science that you might find when we're talking about the colors of the aurora. Um, I heard that you can hear them sometimes even when you can't see them. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, I've heard that too. I mean, I I generally find from the literature, it looks like the sounds appear when you have a really violent uh, auroral display, one that's moving a lot uh, and really bright colors. Um, But I have also heard that people are able to pick up uh, aurora that are happening on on radio echoes, or you can even get daytime aurora that you can pick up again on radio echoes. And sometimes people claim that there are sounds associated with those. But again, that's quite difficult to corroborate as well. Yeah, I wonder if everybody realizes too, this is happening on the South Pole too. There's just not as much well, exactly. down there, right? So people aren't seeing them and hearing them. Quite right, yeah. It, almost the exact same uh, auroral activity will be happening simultaneously in the North and the South. But obviously there are far fewer people to actually witness it and record it down there. So then we have far less information about the Aurora Australis as we do about the Aurora Borealis. Although there are teams at, at Halley Bay, for example, that is one of the British stations down there, um, and they record the Aurora, but uh, we have more historical data about the Northern Lights. So when it's, you say the activity is the same, is it, does it reach kind of the same latitudes on the same nights? Yeah. The North it's, and it's... South Pole? It's usually quite, yeah, synchronous. You get similar sorts of patterns. Um, sometimes, interestingly, they're inverted, uh, as as maybe you might expect between north and south. But it reaches similar latitudes. Um, it's often similar intensity, similar formations. Um, but but yeah, sometimes there's a, an interesting inversion if you can recognize the patterns in the north and in the south. Interesting. I guess because of the Coriolis effect, because, you know, the Earth's rotation is going to be the opposite in the Southern Hemisphere. So for the same reason that hurricanes are going the opposite direction, the auroras are going the opposite direction. Quite right. Yes. But we don't always expect it when we're talking about sort of uh, atmospheric phenomena that are influenced by the space and the space between the sun and our uh, our planet. But um, yes, yeah, it's also affected by the Earth's movement. Hey, thank you so much for watching. While you're here, check out some other videos you just may like.